<clears throat> so last time uh, we have started, uh, you know, project quality management. Uh, this is a specific knowledge area which is uh, targeted towards building the quality and, uh, you know, continuously keeping the quality and control the quality. So there are three basic uh, process group here, plan quality management, manage quality and control quality. And above that, uh, I believe I might have missed out. We create something called quality management system in a given organization. This is the kind of the templatization process or the in-house uh, rules and regulations what we create uh, to achieve uh, continuous better and better quality or how we keep improving ourselves, right? Have we discussed about QMS? It's called quality management systems. Most of the time, you normally have a separate, uh, you know, intranet pages and all those things for such uh, uh, policies, processes, rule books and templates. So that in every project, we can use these uh, quality management system templates to make sure whatever we do, we do uh, with the best possible quality. Okay. Have you discussed, could you recall quality management systems? Anybody? Oh, was there something discussed in the last class, sir? Yes, sir. Quality oh, management. Okay. I, I missed, I missed the last class. I wasn't there. Last class, no last one, I no problem. Okay, please have a look at those recordings. Uh, do like if you like it. Definitely, and... definitely. Okay, then uh, we discussed about the overall, uh, you know, uh, balance of, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the golden triangle. How do we balance uh, uh, the costs to uh, time? And then we had a look at uh, how these internally reflects quality risk and benefits, right? We have also analyzed these two diagrams based on how uh, the time cost quality or uh, scope cost quality is normally reflected in, uh, you know, risk management in the uh, one, uh, you know, if you try to extra, uh, uh, what you can say, you try to exploit one, the other two might get, you know, um, shrinked or other might, might to get damaged in a due process. That's why the balance is really important. And we do work on these quality triangles or golden triangles. That's what we normally call them. So if anybody asks you about golden triangles, it's a schedule cost scope. Uh, and, you know, uh, same way for the uh, quality triangle as well. Scope cost, uh, 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 scope, cost and schedule. So we try to balance these things throughout our uh, this thing last time we had a look at uh, you know project quality management overview where we studied the inputs outputs uh, and tools and techniques and outputs in uh, plan quality management and manage quality i believe right yes uh, in managed quality uh, we also had a yeah, plan quality management let me yeah we have done this thing let me go ahead yes now we have to understand what we mean by cost of quality or cost of conformance and non-conformance. What is cost of quality overall? Here we are trying to understand whatever efforts we put in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, retrieving the quality, maintaining the quality, controlling the quality and enhancing the quality throughout our project progress, we normally refer to it as a cost of quality. These are normally in the number of efforts uh, rather than number of dollars. And these are the normally efforts spent by the team uh, and a kind of, you know, over coefficient uh, within the organizations to make sure whatever we uh, do in terms of achieving that quality, it's considered again cost of quality. This includes all the effort we put in reviews, uh, all the efforts we put in audits, all the efforts we put in using and building those templates throughout our life cycle. Even the knowledge management process is also considered as one of the most uh, important contribution to the cost of quality. Let's try to understand how this cost of quality, um, you know, thought process works uh, on the ground. Also, there's something called QA and QC, right? QA is quality assurance, QC is quality control. Quality controls predominantly talks about the reviews, the tests, uh, the test runs, uh, the rework, and again, the test run, and all the efforts. But we normally, uh, means as a new project managers or, uh, you know, new leaders, we normally tend to forget the quality assurance part of it. Let me, you know, uh, share some light on quality assurance. Here, what we are talking about, we are talking about all the policies and processes we make or we, uh, you know, update or we learn in the process of increasing the quality. 
or in a CMMI-5 uh, templatization way, continuous improvement in policy is normally referred as a uh, quality assurance with the season processes we adopt, adopt for the defect prevention. Now, what are the defect prevention? Defect preventions are the activity where we try to prevent any defect index, uh, induction throughout our project progress. And these are like, you know, uh, uh, trying to fit the correct skill resources for the correct task. These also include to have internal trainings. These also includes the, you know, documentation or templatization process, which we also build in, in our quality management system. Then we do, uh, you know, use some equipment. Uh, this can be something like even attendance management equipment, uh, even the laptops, desktops, or all those, uh, you know, machines which we use for uh, generating our solutions, services, or projects. And these also uh, contribute to the overall uh, defect prevention cost. They're normally referred as a prevention cost or build a quality product. So all the processes we work towards building a quality product is normally referred to as the uh, prevention cost or defect prevention cost. Then we have to uh, basically understand if we do it right first time, the cost of quality is the least because that's the basic minimum cost you require to build the quality within your product solution support services, right? Now here, uh, we are trying to understand how we can do it right the first time and those scenarios. Then even, uh, you know, there are some reactive costs or what we can call, uh, you know, appraisal cost or assess the quality, control the quality. These are like testings as we discussed, destructive testing loss in terms of if we need to do various additional testing uh, might be from clients, uh, you know, request, might be from the, you know, um, uh, the new induced process uh, within our, um, um, within our, uh, you know, overall uh, processes included uh, in the, uh, in our day-to-day, uh, -day, you know, life of project execution. Then the inspections, these includes audits, reviews, the PMO help and everything else. So here, what we are trying to do, we are trying to, uh, you know, build the quality in whatever way we can and to make sure the quality is getting improved day by day throughout the progress, right? And that's the most, uh, you know, important, uh, that's the most, uh, what you can say, a crucial part of the quality management system. And these all contributes to the cost of quality. Uh, there are cost of non-conformance also. So in case when you run this testing, uh, you know, uh, cycles, there are some bugs are found, right? Now these bugs have to be rectified before giving the delivery to the client. It can be something like a fault, uh, you know, found in a product you're going to deliver in the next few days, uh, in the, you know, next sprint or something like that. Now we need to get those bugs fixed before we promise or before we deliver anything. So all those reworks, even sometimes the scrap, let's say if you are manufacturing pen and then some of the rework costs are beyond, you know, the recovery. So what do we do? We normally scrap the product altogether. We like to, you know, the, whatever scrap product uh, is created is also included in the cost of quality. The manufacturing cost of scrap product is included in the cost of quality. Then external failure cost like liabilities, warranty work, loss business is also kind of uh, added to the cost of quality. These are like efforts spent during and after the project because of the failures. Now I have taken this image from a uh, PM book here. I, uh, they, I don't know why they normally spay, uh, you know, stress on the term money rather than effort. I would really like to have the, you know, word money replaced by efforts because we spend efforts normally. We as a project manager, we don't directly spend any money. Well, indirectly you can say we are spending money. So uh, it's not a wrong in any way, but it's kind of a long shot rather than a clear part of it. But yes. Uh, this is what uh, the PM book have said, PM book six, and that's what we are learning. Okay, let me play a small video for you on the cost of quality. Here we are trying to understand what type of cost we incur on daily basis uh, to make sure we are building uh, the best quality, uh, best possible, you know, quality uh, for the uh, uh, project exhibitions. Okay, let me stop the share. Also, let me. 
So I'll repeat again, cost of quality is all the efforts you spend for preventative cost, appraisal cost, internal failure cost, and external failure cost. We should avoid all type of failures, uh, you know, by the way of efficiently working, by the way of doing the things right in the at the first time, and so on. So, on. so for that, whatever we need to, you know, provide, like training, templatization, the best possible equipment, and time to do it right. And this is what we call learning curve, right? So this learning curve, whatever you try to process throughout the initial phases of project or initial phases of onboarding of a given resources uh, to make everything right at the first time. This includes in the cost of quality. Does anybody have any questions on cost of quality as of now? Again, I repeat, this is really, really important question from any interview perspective where we are trying to understand how to reduce the cost of quality overall, how to make the project more and more and more efficient day by day. Okay, let me move to the next slide and we'll basically keep uh, understanding this uh, managed quality now. Now here, what are we trying to do in the managed quality? As we just seen, we need to uh, put the uh, cost of quality into control. What does that mean? That means that in case if you as a project manager feels uh, the resources are not up to the scale, we might uh, you know hire an external trainer. The, well, that includes cost of quality overall, but see, still uh, you are increasing your cost of quality by the way of necessity. And you can basically uh, put these things to you, the PMOs of the world, the auditors of the world, where they'll try to understand, yes, you are doing the right thing. Now, here, basically, we are closely working with organizational internal quality management systems. These quality management systems, which generate various templatization for us, which generate various audit processor uh, processes, review processes for us throughout our project management, uh, you know, execution throughout our project management life cycle. Okay, let's try to understand from input tools and techniques and output perspectives. Uh, here, the most strange thing you can find. We haven't include, uh, include um, environmental or uh, EEF or environmental, oh man, um, external environmental processes because what all quality we manage, we manage within our organization. Okay. That's why EEF is excluded from the imports. The project management plan basically, we are working on quality management plan. So that's the most crucial input here. Uh, the project manage, the project documents are knowledge archival, the lessons learned register, the quality control, the testing procedures, the rework procedures, whatever you included in the terms of efforts needs to spend on these things uh, with respective measures. So that's all quality control measures are the input for managed quality. Then we have quality matrices. As we discussed in our last session, many of organizations have something called matrices to track on a daily basis. Now, how these matrices work, any cost a schedule or uh, effort variance normally get escalated uh, right away into PMIS. And this PMIS is, uh, you know, my, uh, minutely managed by all the topmost management of the operation. So that in case your project is uh, heading for the yellow or the red, they'll try to basically help you out in one way or the other. So that we get the project in the green, and then we keep doing it in the green. That's what the ma major intention of this PMIS as well. And as we know, all the top managements, uh, there might have some really great managers with the experience, uh, with the so-called domain you're working in and all, all those things. So that's why these quality matrices, do you uh, uh, does the automatic escalation to the problem as well as it's represent your project in terms of cost of quality, efficiency, and all the other parameters. Because if you want to, you know, understand any deviation throughout the scope, cost, quality, matrices, it results in other disturbances, as we seen in those, uh, you know, those two triangle images, right? So that's why quality matrices are really, really important factor. Indirectly, within the quality matrices, you can easily calculate cost of quality, the efficiency if you try to compare with other projects and all those scenarios as well. So that's why. Quality matrices are the most advanced uh, uh, continuous monitoring processes for any given project. We you want to uh, you know apply PNP book or not. So whatever we collect the data in terms of project progresses, 
uh, are clearly reflected from quality matrices, the uh, quality matrices, and these are all numbers we are talking about. And as we say, numbers don't lie, and that's why quality matrices are a kind of a reliable representation of a, your project, other than the project management plan, be it a Microsoft project management plan, be it a Jira um, project management plan, or any other software you use for the project management planning. Then, of course, the risk report. What type of risk are you taking? <clears throat> now, there's another, you know, side of this coin called risk management. The risk management, there are some sort of a safer project manager. There are some sort of a dangerous project manager. And there are some sort of a projector who play to your life, which are like uh, the most dangerous project manager. Why we call dangerous project managers? Because they take quite a good amount of risk to complete the project or to move the project uh, into the successful criteria whenever times comes. So that's why uh, these uh, type of risk reports or risk uh, uh, identification tracking or the review of risk register will give you a clear idea of what type of project manager you are or the, you know, whatever colleague you're trying to analyze are. And this risk management, whatever you include, is basically monitored on almost weekly basis, if not daily basis, where we try to understand if there's any risk which is getting materialized today, next day, or something like that, so that we have to you know, be prepared for such scenario. And that's why risk reports are really a crucial factor in quality management. Then, of course, we have organizational process assets. Organizational process assets give us all those details, like the templatization, the quality parameters like the review procedures, audit procedures, and every such scenario, including the project life cycle planning, like test, rework test. Again, the extra test, uh, testing measures, uh, like regression testing, stress testing, load testing, performance testing, and all such type of additional testings you might perform on your project, on your product, on your solution, on your services, are considered as a kind of, uh, are considered towards the cost of quality. And hence, they require some sort of efforts one way or the other. And that's how our project plan might get changed accordingly. If you try to add another uh, testing procedure, it might reflect in some bugs. It might some uh, reflect some deviation from the requirement. And that's where we might require to sp spend some extra hours. So whenever you try to add the testing parameters, within your project execution, please remember that it might add to various development, uh, subsidiary development efforts as well. So it's not just the testing, which basically reflects on the efforts, it's the basically rework is also scarier sometimes than the testing itself. Okay, then let's understand tools and technique here. Please talk to me if you have any questions or anything which I have said is not according to your thought processes. Because as a person, as an artist, we all a good project manager. Believe that. Start believing that from this point onwards. And uh, try to understand whatever project you manage, you have to understand these techniques, these tools to make sure you are basically executing the project with the least possible quality cost and most possible efficiency. Let's try to understand. The data gathering, here are the checklists which are provided by the organizations. These checklists basically, uh, you know, uh, walk you towards the overall compliance of the quality management systems. So whenever somebody joins an organization, we have something like employee induction or a consult consultant induction workshop. There, the organizations or the top boss of the organizations normally guide you on where you can find the checklist, the templatization, where you can find the standardized uh, procedure, for any project life cycle. These policies and processes to be adopted for a given project management execution. And that's why these checklists are really, really important. And there are few checklists who normally gets uploaded to PMIs as well. The checklist like, have you confirmed uh, with the life cycle? Have you worked on the similar life cycle earlier? Do you know the scrum policies and processes? So checklist for questions like these, basically make them comfortable in your project management capability as well. So this is not just assessing the uh, you and the project team. 
but basically overall trying to make sure we are we are basically aware of those you know variance uh, uh, variance uh, disturbance lines uh, the project uh, how the project manager should uh, control the project in case of uh, any escalation or any such deviation from the normal project path who should uh, you contact who should be basically can be coming to you and you know asking question like why this why not this and all those scenarios then let's understand the data analysis as we see in the matrices right all these matrices are basically analyzed on almost daily basis if not hourly there are some project, uh, critical project or mission critical project i, I should say uh, which are monitored by pmo on almost hourly basis any deviation from the normal execution path uh, they'll come down running to your cubicles and ask to, uh, to get the things right, right away. Now, these data analysis are really, uh, you know, done on almost uh, every project review. The alternative analysis, where, why you chosen this alternative to then that alternative? Why have you chosen the iris scanner rather than fingerprint scanner, which iris scanner are, of course, like three to four times costlier, but still you chose because of the accuracy because of understanding how I can get the you know high quality building in my system you know delivery and so on and so forth. So here I'm trying to basically uh, archive all the relevant artifacts to the knowledge management area where we can produce, uh, produce this artifact to showcase to the auditor to, to the PMOs or whoever wants to review the alternative analysis or document analysis process. The document analysis normally talks about uh, mostly the client supplied document, the way you have archived, or the documents which you have created to make sure if new resources join, you normally share these documents with him or her. These are what we can call project familiarization checklist. There could be normally three or five documents which we normally share with the new joinees, new joinees to the project team to make sure he understand the basic bird's eye view picture, he understand the basic, uh, you know, the way we are executing the project. So you might have a paragraph on agile term. If he or she never worked in agile term, then you might direct him or her for something like online recorded training to be completed before you start working. And that way, what we are doing, we are trying to basically make sure the learning curve is the shortest possible learning curve for a given project. And the process analysis. What type of process have you chosen? Is it the right one? Why have you included performance testing? Yes, because in the requirement, I can clearly see there are quite a few requirements in terms of performance expectations. These are like the login process should be completed within 10 seconds. Something like this means I'm just you know uh, sharing any uh, raw thought process, uh, thoughts comes to my mind. But there, there could be any performance uh, requirement like this car should we go to zero to 100 in four seconds, in five seconds. Well, again, these are the requirements and any client might have their own requirements. So that way, any performance requirement, any changes in your processes for adopting to, to those performance requirements can add up to the cost of quality. So all these decision-making processes are normally questioned in audit. And then also any process you take or add to the given um, project progress might be uh, looked at as a non-conformance. And then you might have to, you know, uh, produce relevant artifact of that non-conformance approval. And there's a normal scenario. Don't get offended by such things. Okay. Whenever you pile up on cost of quality, it's not a bad thing uh, on the ground because you're trying to push in more and more quality in your work, right? But again, you are incurring more cost. So that's a kind of detrimental to the overall profitability of a project. If you are well within the range, then you can do that. But if you are still, you know, uh, like I said, walking on the edge, then it's difficult. Then it's really, you know, challenging to understand how we can add more quality to the given project, right? So those kind of scenarios. Then we have something called root cause analysis, root cause analysis, as a tool and technique in managed quality. I believe many of you can, uh, you know, have might have heard this word root cause analysis. And uh, every time we say, please go to the root and try to solve the problem. This is similar scenario here. If there's any deviation, 
we have to do something like root cause analysis. What made this deviation? Why I'm incurring more cost than whatever I planned? So all such scenario have to be analyzed or the root has to be fined by the project manager. And this is the most crucial responsibility. And this also includes the cost of quality in indirect way because whatever you add, the processes in terms of either, you know, uh, improving the quality or improving the, you know, overall efficiency, all these processes, whatever you apply, are normally taken as a deviation from a normal project life cycle. And these has to be explained with all the relevant artifacts, uh, all the relevant alternative anal analysis to make sure the PMOs, the auditors of the worlds are satisfied up to a good extent so that they'll say, yes, this is really good one. Uh, this decision uh, is taken by you was a risky, but still you carried it out and it helped the project. Everything gets uh, as added, uh, taken positively if you are a successful. But if you are unsuccessful, if the project is heading for the yellow or the red, then all these uh, you know questions might take you to the level. Hey, I said you so. Why you still chosen this alternative? And those kind of scenario also. So here, as a project manager, we keep walking on this stage uh, quite a few times throughout our project life cycle. So this is uh, these are the you know most crucial thing we should uh, worry about, we should care about on every day. For whatever decision we take, we shouldn't go normally in a non-confirmative way, non-confirmous way. So that whatever organizational processes are, uh, as per the guidelines, let's try to complete the project uh, on that path only, unless and until you are very sure about your uh, added success factors, you might get an award. Yes, that's right. But are, do we work for award? No, we normally work for the normal, happy and successful life. So for that, following the path is the best possible policy most of the time. Again, most of the time, why I say that? Because if you are very confident, if you are confident beyond, uh, you know, um, what I can say, beyond these, uh, you know, happiness, then yes, definitely you can try. You should try, you must try. And you might get awarded. Uh, for these scenarios as well. Then again, decision making. Yes, decision making is a really critical double edged sword for a given project manager at this time because whatever you choose, like we have just discussed about the happiness versus efficiencies or happiness versus awards kind of scenario. Yes, these things do matter in real life as well, as we have seen many times, right? In project management, this talks about the any deviation from the normal processes you take to either build efficiency or reduce the cost of quality. And these basically have to be supported by all artifacts for why I have chosen this decision over that decision kind of scenario. In the project management, we normally, it's a team execution, but the responsibility is on the project manager's shoulders, not the scrum masters, not the PMOs of the world, not the auditors of the world, not the test managers of the world, believe me. So whoever is the project manager is normally get crucified for any unsuccessful uh, project for any damaging decisions he or she might take. And that's why decision making is really, really critical in terms of a project managing, uh, project management, uh, you know, skill sets. Now let's take a look at data representation. This talks about how do you create these artifacts? for your decision-making, for your alternative analysis, and all the other relevant policies and processes. Affinity diagram, these type of, you know, cause and effect diagrams, flow chart, histogram, matrix diagram, and scatter diagrams. These are the six uh, typical diagrams um, we might utilize to, you know, create the relevant artifact or create the relevant document to make sure whenever you are being audited for whatever decisions, or whatever alternative you have chosen are as a supporting factors to these things. Uh, well, nowadays, mostly we use flowcharts and the minutes of meetings and the cost uh, or the quotations and all those supporting document rather than these diagrams. But yes, still many of these diagrams can be drawn if you feel you are comfortable with that. Okay, there are you know few diagrams which uh, really very you know uh, not so common. So like affinity diagrams, the histograms, the matrix diagram are really far and few. Normally we do cause and effect diagram. These are also called as fishbone diagrams. 
we normally do flow charts quite a lot of times where we normally try to uh, you know start with uh, uh, the complete event happening and the decision taking along the paths of those things then we have scatter diagrams where we try to put down uh, uh, a point on a graph whenever it crosses uh, the overall you know um, cost versus efforts kind of scenarios again these uh, choice of uh, x and y axis depends on the actual scenario actual uh, you know uh, root cause whatever you want to fight out but still more all the scatter diagrams are basically a graph of four quadrants and we normally uh, go with the best possible scenario here and that's what we can present for uh, data representation for uh, you know uh, doc, um, alternative analysis or decision analysis for that matters then of course we have audits to make sure the project is not deviated from the normal uh, execution path we have chosen at the start and then as we say design for x these are what we normally call as a trend analysis chart for you know cost schedule or efforts and these normally uh, um, try to uh, make sure we are on the right path or not or how much we are deviated from the s curve we already planned at the start of the project normally uh, the extrapolation graphs or uh, uh, what you can say um, extension graph are normally also referred as a s curve we've seen the s curve like in last last session so this s curve is basically give you a correct trend for where we stand now and where we are basically going to reach if you keep uh, going at the same speed with the same parameters in our hand and that's why this design for x uh, is a kind of way to check out where am I right now and how am I going? Uh, means uh, how the things look uh, 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 within the next uh, sprint uh, after you know um, next few sprint or till we complete the project. Then we have problems solving as a tools and technique because throughout the project life cycles there are many challenges in terms of ego clashes, in terms of I told you so but you never listen to me. And all those such scenarios where we have all the HR resources fighting in between and wasting quite a good amount of efficiencies. So for such scenario, as a project manager, I am basically kind of responsible to make sure we'll resolve all such conflict uh, as soon as they happen in the least possible time and efforts. But again, we, re we really live in a practical world. There are some scenario. Um, you know, might get um, out of hands or might get, you know, uh, might take a really challenging terms. And all this uh, scenario, we have to take help from something like COE, SME, or HR in case of some personal conflicts. And HR manager can definitely help you on uh, internal conflict resolutions, negotiation, and all such tactics. Then, whatever the quality improvements methods you have chosen uh, with the deviation from the, you know, uh, methods we have already applied if they are success you get awarded rewarded left and right but if they are uh, not so successful you might get blamed for the loss of efficiency increased cost of quality and everything is as well so these are again double edged stores so whenever you try to implement any new uh, you know improvement methods by yourself or mm, by the way i thought so kind of scenario please keep uh, yourself away your personal life is your personal life. Your project management is another ball together, uh, uh, ball game altogether. So that's why, as a project manager, as a new project manager, I need to really uh, careful about implementing new processes throughout my project. This makes you a safe project manager, and your first few projects should be a safe project execution. And then afterwards, when you are confident, you might try to implement new policies and procedures even uh, you know get some award for such uh, you know uh, processes recommendation throughout the organizations and some some like that okay so we need to be really careful in implementing or choosing any new processes then the outputs are of course the quality reports the test evolution documents here which basically leads to the test run reports and the rework uh, you know effort requirements and so on so forth then the change request Again, the change requests, as we discussed, are normally detrimental to your uh, current planning. So whatever plan you have made for current screen or current phrase, 
let it continue throughout it. And then you can add all these change requests which are approved by the change control board and so on. So forth. Then you have project management plan updates for managed qualities are, of course, the quality management plan, the scope baseline. This talks about if uh, you have changed any additional uh, test procedures like stress testing, performance testing, anything. And this, how it basically affects the scope baseline. So how many hours additions are you looking for a given sprint and so on and so forth. Same, the schedule was like, what are the change in the schedules which are normally applied by these new improvements method. And of course, the cost baselines get repeated with these two. So all they are talking about the golden triangle to be managed, to be uh, reviewed on each and every instances of our project management execution milestone. The project documents updates are issue logs, lessons run register and risk register. The issue logs normally talk about if there are any additional changes, challenges in terms of whatever you have planned. So like we said, we uh, let's say, uh, let's take an example of adding uh, performance testing to your uh, uh, performance testing round uh, to your overall project execution. This automation testing round can be done within minutes and creating those test plans will hardly take an hour or two. <clears throat> but the rework which we are expected can run into 10 hours, 20 hours and more depending upon the scalability of your architecture, depending upon the overall performance of uh, the current performance and the gap in it and you know other relevant factors. So here we are trying to understand if a small change or small addition in my project management th thought process can add us and us to the uh, schedule baseline or the scope baseline. So that's why I need to be really, uh, you know, uh, vigilant for such additions, subtractions, or modifications. Then there are lessons to learn register. So if you have added any new policies and processes to make sure your efficiencies increase, your cost of quality is reduced, and you might get rewarded for such scenario, and you might have to add such practices to the knowledge archival uh, systems called lessons learned register as well, where this can be copied by others, this can be leveraged by others as well. Then we have a risk register where we normally list down the risk. Even such a scenario of choosing new alternative path, there could be some additional risk which needs to be added to the, uh, you know, the risk register. And that's why it is reflected as an output to the managed quality. Does that make sense to you? Any questions on managed quality? No, sir. I'm good. Thank you. Sure, sir. This is, yeah. So uh, this is one of the most crucial process. It normally starts with the project induction and it goes till you close the project. And even after that, because there was some, you know, uh, uh, QMS audits, they normally referred as a QMS audit or knowledge archival audits. There we normally see what type of knowledge archived have you, you know, contributed to and all those scenarios. That's why managed quality is really important from various uh, you know, aspects of our project executions. Let me take you to the next uh, and the last uh, you know, um, knowledge group here, uh, sorry, the last process group here called control quality. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to control the quality in a way which is within the deviation limit. So if we are saying we have to consume, let's say uh, 450 hours through the current sprint for three days. Let's take a raw example. And I'm working with, let's say, you know, a good number of resources here. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to, uh, you know, uh, complete the sprint within 45 hours. But at the end, uh, sorry, 450 hours. Then if we are taken or chosen any deviation in terms of like added performance testing here, which might add up to, let's say, 40, 45 hours additionally. So there's a 10% deviation from my actual uh, you know, effort spending. Now this also reflects on schedule as well as cost, right? So here, what we are trying to do, we are trying to understand the impact and the relevant repercussions of these impacts. And then we need to understand how to basically absorb this shock. Is this going to get uh, you know, the project extended? No, I don't want that, right? So what should I do? I'll basically add these hours to the resources which are not on the critical task. Mm -hmm. 
and this way yeah, I, class hello hello okay and this way i am trying to understand how to absorb the shocks of the addition but not a risk <laughs> that uh, you know uh, a possibility of adding uh, you know uh, such shock shock uh, absorbers uh, within your project execution so what we do then of course we need to enlarge the schedule one way or the other now here we need to really keep in mind are we deviating from the schedule if yes then yes i need to create all the relevant artifacts to make sure i'll not be uh, you know uh, crucified in my audit saying okay this is because of you we are spending so much efforts and so on so forth and that's why quite a few project managers they normally play safe in adding any policies and procedures quite a few time now here we need to understand we need to understand the need and the importance of that uh, policy and procedure or i might get it approved from the change control board as well and these are the you know best possible uh, uh, thought process we can apply uh, within the given uh, you know um, uh, within the given um, uh, division marks we have to occur uh, we need to uh, process uh, for our project and that's a kind of you know a safer route but again the change control board might take a good amount of time in approving your deviations as well so again it's a you know kind of uh, uh, we have to find the median and we normally try to find this medium uh, after we gain uh, you know ample of experience on implementing such changes within the given project life cycle let's uh, have a look at control quality now in control quality it includes we have quality management plan knowledge archival system quality by prices where we are clearly getting detail about if any deviations are happening or not test and evaluation documents these guides you on the cost of quality direct numbers then we have approved change request these guides on the actual impact on your scope schedule based lines and the change in effort requirement for a given sprint for a given phase and then the deliverables you have achieved in terms of are they were quality deliverables is the client satisfied with your deliverables satisfied up to what extent and every organization have something called consumer survey mechanism they called csr consumer survey review uh, consumer survey uh, you know receipt and all those you know type of acronyms we normally use for that so these csrs normally help you out to uh, understand the quality we acquired or the satisfaction we acquired on those deliverables which are delivered to the client then we have work performance data this talks about the efficiency we work uh, we are working with and the past efficiency where we try to compare our efficiency to make sure we are doing at least uh, up to a good performance execution or we are trying to uh, you know improve the efficiency one way or the other then we have enterprise environmental factors any challenges in terms of detrimental effect to your project like in corona we have to start working from home and all those things right so these type of scenario are already um, normally supported uh, by these auditors as well as pmo uh, pmo bodies to make sure this is beyond our control right so here we are trying to understand what we can and can control as well so if there are any scenario which a project manager couldn't control that can be normalized uh, to a level that this deviation is uh, kind of approved by default and there are some organizational process assets some policies and processes to help us out to uh, basically clear out such uh, you know deviations by eefs and supported by opas and that's how we keep uh, adopting to the preventive measures or risk materialization in such scenario the tools and techniques we use in control quality are data gathering checklist check sheets statistical sampling and questionnaires and survey here these guys are talking about any and all mechanism we have used uh, to make sure our uh, you know pmis uh, the project management information system as well as the matrices calibrations are up to the mark for a given project so that there is no confusion being created at the top management level and that's why we normally have some checklist which are normally done by auditor rather than pm uh, project manager but in some organizations 
this can be also uh, shouldered to the PMC responsibility. Again, this talks about something like a typical checklist to make sure you are not deviated from the current project path. Some check sheets or the plans or pie charts where we normally uh, review these charts on a weekly basis or a periodic basis uh, might be uh, within the sprint review or something like that to make sure we are not deviated from the actual project plan, whatever you plan. Or even going through the Microsoft project plan, give you a clear idea if we are debating or not. Then we have also uh, some really detailed mathematical processes like statistical sampling or a kind of survey mechanism to make sure we are doing good in terms of uh, you know satisfaction, in terms of the appreciation for the added quality burdens to the project team. Again, why I've uh, you know, given this example because quite a few challenges are normally uh, erupted within the project management team. And that's why we need to be really uh, you know, careful of not uh, stepping on any toes as well. Because everybody has their own roles and responsibility. As a project manager, <clears throat> I am the leader. I am the coordinator for the whole project team. Now, if there are any challenges within the team, that has to be addressed on the priority. And all such satisfaction or questionnaire survey also reflect, uh, reflect any unrest within my team adversely on my performance. The data analysis. We do performance reviews and root cause analysis on a periodic level for any deviations we might adopt to. Any non-conformance we adopt to is basically analyzed on performance review and root cause analysis to make sure we are doing the correct thing for adding the efficiency <clears throat> and resolving some challenges we faced earlier. So these type of data analysis with the relevant artifact might support or always support the project managers in one way or the other. Then we have various audits and reviews and inspection to make sure we are not deviated from the organizational project execution baselines, um, schedule cost uh, efforts and all those things. Here we can also you know, understand uh, or re-evaluate the testing and product evaluation processes so that we are assured that the project is at optimum quality and the uh, product is also at optimum quality. Make sure whenever we deliver this product to the client, client is, client is going to get, uh, client is going to be a bit happier than as he received the delivery. And then he might start UAT to make sure uh, we make him a really good satisfied uh, client and so on and so forth. The data representation, again, same as the, the you know, um, managed quality scenario here, we try to present these uh, progresses with these data representation like cause and effect, the fishbone diagram, the control charts. These are, again, a kind of S-curves we present in terms of uh, extrapolation uh, analysis or trend analysis uh, for a cost effort and schedule in a way that we are trying to prove we are within the division limits as far as the organizational management process goes. Then of course we have historiogram to make sure the other project on the similar line and my project are going line in line or my project is exceeding expectations or something like that sort. Then the scatter diagram. These are normally a graphs we plot to make sure we are doing better than the others kind of scenario. Of course I plan all those audit meetings inspection meetings and you know any other meeting to support my uh, decisions in uh, any project life cycle methodologies or any division from the normal project inspection uh, S curves or you know these graphs. The outputs are quality control measurements and these we are talking about the matrices what we have discussed about quality matrices uh, you know predominantly then we have verified deliverables. So whatever you have uh, delivered, given the deliverables, and they are verified the client, client, by the customers and the clients, then we receive the feedback or the surveys from those clients to check out if they are happy, uh, you know, they are not happy or whatever the things, and we try to make it up to them to make sure we are not creating an unhappy customers. And that's why these verified deliverables have a very critical output point in control quality. And again, this is in a monitoring and control process loop, which makes sure we have to review these things on almost periodic basis. Then we have both performance information. This normally 
targets to various efficiency of man material machine altogether to make sure we are executing the project well within the organizational efficiency marks or above those efficiency marks. Of course, the chain requests which are detrimental to my project schedule, I need to understand how much efforts I can you know, spend with the current sprint, current phrase so that my other tasks won't get uh, delayed or damaged, uh, specifically the critical tasks. Then we have the project uh, quality management plan uh, getting updated for any change or deviations or non conformers we might have applied for. And the project documents updates are issue logs, lessons learned register, risk register, and test and evolution documents. Now the issue logs, as we discussed, talks about any additional spending we are going to do on efforts, how we are going to manage those things. So these are like added additional challenging issues for a control quality uh, you know, processes. Then we have lessons learned register where we archive all our new learnings with the knowledge management portal of the organizations. Then we have risk register updates. If we are taking any additional risk, we might add or we review the risk scores in case of any project review happening at this point of time. Then we have test and evolution documents, which clearly guides us how much the cost of quality prevailing in your current execution. Does anybody have any questions or confusion on control quality? Have you understood the input tools and techniques and output in a control quality process in the quality management knowledge area? Any questions uh, for me at this moment? No, sir. No, sir. We are good, right? Okay. Uh, just to revise things, let me play a small video called Project Quality Management Overview. This is again from a separate trainer, which can basically give you another insight for these, uh, you know, uh, comments. Ask me for that. Uh, so here, what we are looking for, we are looking for. Uh, Thanks a lot for the number. So we are looking for all type of hierarchical chart or, or what you what I can say, hierarchy implementation within your organization. Let's say you have a grade based hierarchy, um, grade one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And depending upon your organizational policy and procedure, you can have eight grades, 18 grades, or you know, 30 grades, and so on and so forth. So adaptability to the hierarchy within the organization is a necessity for all human resources as well as plan my resource management. So here I'm trying to understand how can I cope up with such hierarchy if I need to approach somebody with the ease and the you know uh, necessary requirements of uh, all the mumbo jumbos for approaching somebody as an you know if it's a really senior person within our organizations and other other reflective parameters as well. Then we have responsibility uh, assess, assignment matrix. These typically talks about who are working today, who are my critical resources today, what are my critical resources tasks, and how am I managing the risk of critical tasks delay or alternate resource assignment for the critical task or the other critical task in line in succession. What does mean? I don't want to delay the project one way or the other throughout my uh, you know, project life cycle. So I'll make sure I might have a resource cushioning in terms of uh, the other resources are free for at least a couple of hours in case uh, somebody might not uh, you know, feel sick or in case some resources might be delayed or something like that. So in such scenario, I want to make sure all my project is on track within the division limits. And that's how this responsibility assignment matrix reflects to almost each and every uh, you know, uh, task I have assigned with a given resource. It, uh, it normally talks about man, material, machine. And then what you can say, we have something called text-oriented format. Text-oriented format normally talks about the simplistic way of project planning. Here, whatever you do, like you have a sequential task plan, right? You normally, complete one task, then you can task, uh, start another task. You don't go in between, you go, go jump in between. So you normally execute in a strict disciplined way or a sequential way. And these type of sequential execution of tasks give you a clear idea of the progress, clear idea of the milestone achievement also. And that's why we normally follow such uh, type of formats 
uh, like you can say Gantt chart or you know um, there are various other chart as well in text oriented formats but we normally follow the text oriented charts uh, to understand the single sequential disciplined execution of our task then we have organizational theory where we normally talk about theories like Maslow, the basic human needs theory and all those theory to make sure we have all our resources charged enough to work on their maximum efficiency, to work on their full efficiency for a given day. So that's why we use organizational theory tools to make sure the efficiency within my project is at uh, you know best possible level. Then we do have meetings uh, and these you can say a kind of encouragement type of meeting or a project luncheon or a project get together and all those such activity to make sure the efficiency of my resources is at the peaks whenever we work as per the schedule. The outputs are resource management plan, the team charter. The team charter is another additional document we might or might not create in many organizations, which gives you a hierarchical chart within your project organization. So you have project manager, team lead, uh, test lead, test managers, and all the you know release manager, configuration, you know lead, and all those things. These we might create a hierarchy for a bigger project. But if you're not working with a, a bigger or a huge projects, then we don't normally go for a team charter, or we know everybody personally, right? In those scenario, like a team of ten or you know twelve resources, we normally don't have a team charter. But if you go to a bigger team like 50, 80, then you might require a team charter to understand what are the uh, what type of task he or she is allocated to, what type of job responsibility, and the uh, you know um, authorities he or she has at a given point, and so on and so forth. So that's why team charter can be uh, additional document you need to you know create and distribute among your project teams just to make sure everybody understand the hierarchy and where they, they are on these, you know, organizational hierarchy levels. The product documents update are assumption log and issue log. Assumption logs, as we normally assume, everybody will work at its optimum efficiency at least. But still, if there are some detrimental effects like corona, working from homes, my uh, I have a headache and those kind of challenges, or I might come, uh, um, I'm stuck in a traffic, so I'll be delayed office for by an hour or so. And those scenarios are normally have to be reflected in assumptions as well as in the risk registers accordingly. So we update these two documents uh, for such, uh, you know, delays and for such uh, additional, uh, you know, things within our um, uh, plan resource management deviations. Any, any questions on plan resource uh, management? Uh, Knowledge area as of now. Could we understand how do you plan resources from inputs, outputs, uh, and tools and techniques way? Yeah. It's good, right? Now these are simple enough plans. Means if you go, you know, above and beyond uh, uh, knowledge area nine and further, these are simplistic small knowledge area. But again, these are also critical in our helping to plan the project effectively scenario. So that's why knowing this knowledge area clarifies some doubts, clarifies some you know clearly defined way of managing a project, and that's why we normally uh, you know work on this knowledge area uh, day in day out. We normally closely work on our project management plan to make sure I am within those division lines and I try to achieve this project day by day or try to walk towards the project objectives day by day, step by step. Okay. Uh, we are already at the limit of our time, so let's stop here and let's start to do a remaining pro uh, process group in the resource management knowledge area next time, okay? Uh, we'll have our next session on uh, 17, uh, 16, 18, right? So Saturday, 9 p.m. we are meeting, okay? Anybody have any question for me at this moment? No, sir. Okay, let's plan to meet on 9 p.m. EST on 18th June, okay? Thanks for your time. Let's see you again at on 18th June. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you, sir.